So in the last lecture, we finished talking about uh, how to separate allocation from construction, essentially by using placement E, for example, and operator name, and how to separate uh, destruction from deallocation, essentially by directly invoking destructors and then using operator to eat. And what we're going to be doing is sort of building on this and working up to some actual uh, practical code examples where we use some of the techniques that we've been talking about. Uh, but first, there's a few other things that I need to introduce here. Uh, the first is the uh, function template called the uh, called address of in the standard library. And basically what it does is, is sort of what you would guess. You, you basically give it something and it gives you the address of that thing in memory. Um, you might say, well, wait a minute, why not just use the address of operator? We have ampersand, the ampersand operator in C++, the address of operator. Uh, the issue is it can be overloaded. So you, if for a class, it can overload the address of operator and it can make it not give the address. It can do something else. And some people might say it's a little bit questionable whether you'd want to do that, but there are some maybe legitimate uses for some com more complicated classes where you might want to overload the address of operator. But anyway, because of the fact you can do it, putting aside whether it's a sensible thing to do in code or not, because it can be done, um, you want to protect yourself against that. Um, so when you take the address of something, um, if it's something that the type is not known, like this would only arise, in, I guess, in the context of templates. Like you're writing a template function, like some template code, and you don't know what the type is that you're dealing with because it's a template. And because of this, you, when you take, you wouldn't want to take the address of it because maybe that particular type overloads the address of operator, and the address of operator doesn't actually give you the address; it does something else. Uh, so this is a context in which this should be used. And so it just works in a very straightforward manner. So like, for example, here we have a, a template function. It's parameterized on this type T. So when we're taking it, and because the, the type of X, the thing that we're taking the address of here, because it's of type T and we don't know what T is at compile time when we're writing the code, like we don't know, uh, because of this, if that type overloads the address of operator, it might, we might not actually get the address if we just use ampersand X. So this is the sort of use case where we would use address of. So in some of the subsequent code that we're writing, you'll often see, because a lot of it tends to be template, uh, template classes and so on, and where we don't know what the types involved actually are, often we use the address of function. And I guess I, I have an example here. So like to, to make this a little bit more concrete, I have this class called foo, um, which doesn't do too much, but one of the things it does do is it overloads the address of operator here. And what does it do? Well, it returns a pointer to a foo, but it returns a null pointer. So basically, if you take the address of anything, any foo, it says it's null, um, which is probably not going to be what you'd want. But you can do this. Like, you can overload. This would probably not be a sensible use case for overloading the address of operator. Um, like categorically, you could say this would be stupid to do. But there might be some use cases where you can kind of justify it to a certain extent. Anyway, but because of this, if we, for example, down below here, we do something like we create a foo object and then we say address of foo is a null pointer. Well, clearly this doesn't really make sense, right? Because f is a local variable. I mean, it can't be null. I mean, it's got a well-defined address on the stack somewhere. Uh, but because it over this class overloads the address of operator, we're not really getting the address. We're getting whatever the address of operator gives us and it gives us a null pointer because it's always just categorically returning null pointer. Anyway, but on the other hand, if we use address of instead, if we assert address of f is not equal to the null pointer, this will always be true. In other words, this address of f will actually give us the true address of the object f, and it can't be a null pointer because it's on the stack, like it actually has some valid address. And furthermore, we can take and dereference that pointer and go use the get member. The get member just returns the, the value that was stored when we constructed the object. When we construct the object, we give an integer which gets stores it, it's stored as a data member, and here we're just checking to make sure that the value you get back is 42, because when we created this f here, here we initialized it to 42, the data member i. Anyway, but the main point really of this example is just illustrating the use of the address of function and kind of showing you more concretely some of the weirdness that can happen that could cause the built-in address of operator, well, I shouldn't say built-in, but like ampersand operator not to do what you'd expect. Uh, the next thing I need to talk about from the standard library is something called Align Storage. It's a class template that's provided. It's very, very simple. Um, essentially what it does is it allows us to allocate like a, a bag of bytes where the bytes have a, if you look at the, the parameters for the template, it has a size and alignment. So what we can do is basically say, I, I want a class which basically like the data that's associated with the class object is a bag of bytes that has a certain size and a certain alignment. So it essentially does sort of what the name suggests. It just gives us a chunk of storage in memory, like storage, which is aligned. It has a certain size. Um, but you can sort of achieve a similar thing just by using um, 
you know, in some of the earlier examples where we, we have like an array of char and the, the, size, the number of elements in the array is just size of the thing that we want to stick in, in that array. And then we use a line as to control the alignment. But effectively, this sort of does this for you, maybe save you a little bit of typing. So for example, if we wanted to create a, a buffer in memory that ha was the size of the buffer was the size of a std string, because maybe you want to stick a std string in it, and we want the alignment of it to be the alignment of a std string. Um, we, the first parameter here that's passed is the, the size of the chunk of storage, and the second parameter is the alignment. So this would give us a chunk of memory that size is guaranteed to be the size of a std string, and its alignment is the alignment that's needed for a std string. Uh, with that said, I want to actually start to get into some code examples. So there, I think there's three different uh, code examples that I want to go through that in the subsequent slides. Uh, so we're kind of going through things in order of increasing level of complexity. So we'll start out with a relatively simpler example of using some of the concepts that we've been talking about so far. So what we have here is what I refer to as an optional value class. It's somewhat similar to optional in the standard library. There's actually a, a class template called optional. Um, but it's kind of a very stripped down, bare bones version. It doesn't have all the bells and whistles just to kind of keep things simple so the code all fits on one slide, which is good for, for lecture purposes and teaching purposes. Um, what, an option, what this optional value class does, it, it's essentially a, a container that can hold at most one element of a type T. So like it's a template, a templated type where it's templated on T, which is the type of thing that I might choose to store in the optional. I could also choose not to put anything there. So it's basically either it's a T or it's nothing. In other words, the T is optional. It doesn't have to have a T. Um, so there's kind of two states that this any of the objects in this class can be. Either they're holding a value of type T, or they're not holding anything at all. And what we, what we want to do is we want to actually store the object of type T in the opval object itself. So opval is what this class is called. And this is the reason why we need to resort to some of the techniques that we've been talking about in this, the earlier lectures. Basically, we're going to apply some of those ideas here. So in other words, what we have in terms of a picture something like this. You have, you have a hand-drawn version of this, but basically this is the same as the hand-drawn version that you have. So essentially what we're going to have is like a Boolean field, which is true or false, to say like, is there actually a T stored in this object? And if there is a T stored in this object, then this storage area will hold that T. Basically the, the storage area is going to be suitably aligned to hold a T, and also the size of that chunk of, of storage, like the size of this particular data member here, will be appropriately chosen so it can hold an element of size T. In other words, it will be like the size of that chunk of memory will be size of, size of T, essentially. And because we're going to um, store the actual T object in the optval object itself, uh, we have to resort to using things like operator new and delete and placement new and explicit calling of destructors and so on. Um, if I look at the code which comes on the, uh, yeah, I guess it's this slide here. Um, if we look at the data member, so I mentioned like we have a, a data member called valid, which is a Boolean, whether or not that, that uh, optional value actually holds an object of type T. And then we have some storage which actually holds the object if it's there. Um, you might say like, you might say, prior to maybe the last two lectures or something, well, why not just make the code a lot simpler and instead of making the type of this storage underscore data member, instead of making it this align storage, blah, 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 why not just make it a T? I mean, that, that will allow us to store a T in the, in the object, right, in the opt-out object, but why do we not want to do this? What would, what would be the consequence of doing this? In other words, wouldn't it be just simpler to have a Boolean and then have a T in this as a data member and then we you know, put the value into that T? Right, I mean, basically, as soon as we do that, there's no way, like, basically, the Boolean becomes irrelevant because there's, there's no way not to put a T into that object because the instant that you construct one of these objects, whether you like it or not, the data member, if this data member had the type T, the compiler will go, well, this is a class object. I have to initialize it by calling the constructor, and it will call the constructor. It doesn't matter if you like it or not. This is what it will do. So this is what we do is we kind of subvert the type system. We're kind of being sleazy here and saying, even though we really want to put a T in here, we're going to lie to the compiler and say it's just this bag of bytes, you know, it's a bunch of chars or, or whatever it is line storage use, but it's probably something like char, unsigned char, or signed char, or something like that. Uh, so we just have this bag of bytes. And because the compiler, all it sees is a bag of bytes, it goes, oh, it's a bag of bytes. I don't need to call any constructor for it. It's basically just maybe a bunch of chars. Uh, so we achieve the goal of not having it invoke the constructor. But because of this, this means when we want to construct objects, we have to do it ourselves. And the way we do this is by placement. 
And similarly, because the compiler has no idea that there's actually a key stored in that, that storage area, we also have to take on the responsibility of destroying the object because the compiler doesn't know it's there, so it's never going to call a destructor. It doesn't understand that there's anything there at all. It just sees it's a bag of bytes. You know, there's no, no, nothing there of any interest to me at all in terms of the compiler. And let me just back up here just to make sure there wasn't anything I forgot about on this slide. Um, yeah, I guess I covered everything in that figure. So let's actually look at the code then. Um, so again, we have a template class. It's parameterized on, the, parameterized on the type T. So T is the type of element that we're going to store in this container, potentially. Um, if we look, we have just a very, very kind of minimal interface. There's not too many member functions that are provided. So we have a default constructor. So if we, uh, when we construct an op val without any information given to it, it sort of makes sense. We're not giving it anything. There's no way that you could meaningfully construct a T object. So let's initialize it saying that there's no T object stored. So the valid flag will be set to false, meaning there isn't anything stored in this object at all. And when we invoke the, const the constructor, because again, when you invoke a constructor in general, before you enter the body of the function, what happens, all the data members get constructed. So what happens here, we achieve our goal that we wanted to achieve, which is that we don't construct a T, because what happens is it goes, well, the compiler says, well, I'm gonna have to construct a data member. So valid, it's a bool, bool built in type, I don't do anything. Then it goes on to look at this, and you see, because we're sneaky here, we didn't say T, if there was a T here, it'd say, oh, I, gotta, I have to construct this T, because it's a class type, but instead it goes, oh, this is just a bag of bytes, don't do anything. So effectively, the only initialization that happens is just from this initializer list where we're setting valid to false. Uh, the, the storage area is basically just left untouched. It doesn't do anything in the constructor. Uh, the destructor, what it does is it invokes a member function called clear, which essentially what it clear does is maybe we can look at, like, look at things a little bit out of order. So it invokes clear. What clear does is it checks to see if there actually is any data stored, like whether there is a T object stored in this optional value, if there is, we set valid to false, meaning that there isn't one there anymore, and then we destroy it by explicitly calling the destructor. So we need to reinterpret cast. Reinterpret cast, by the way, is the kind of thing that when you see it in code, you always want to look carefully because it's, it's one of the really dangerous types of cast. Basically, what you're saying is I'm completely ignoring the type of this thing complete, like altogether, and treat it as something completely different, like something that it, it is not at all in any way equivalent to the thing that it was originally. So what we had originally, the type of storage underscore, it's one of these aligned storage type is from the standard library. Um, this is a very different thing from T. These are like completely unrelated things. Um, so when you, whenever we use a reinterpret cast, I guess I should be pointing at this line here. When you use reinterpret cast, it's not necessarily that anything's wrong, right? It's provided in the language because there are legitimate uses for it. But when you see it in your code, you always want to think carefully, like, is that really right? Because it's a very dangerous kind of cast to do if you do it in the wrong place because you're, it's, it's allowing you to basically, you know, blow your foot completely off in terms of the type system. You're saying, even though you're saying it's this type in the code, treat it as this totally different thing that could not really be related unless you know something special about the code. Anyway, so this is why we have this reinterpret cast, but effectively all we're doing is we're just taking the address of the storage and then we're using this uh, syntax here to directly invoke the destructor for the T object. Um, and then we go back up to where we sort of branched out on a tangent here. I guess the next thing, for, for simplicity in this example, I've, I've deleted the, the copy, copy and move operations for this class. Essentially, I've uh, deleted the, I guess, the copy constructor and the copy assignment operator. But when you do this, this also will kind of indirectly, as a consequence, will delete the move operations as well. So this type is not copyable, not movable. We could make it this way. It's just that the code will not be, it'll be more complicated. It won't fit on a slide. And at least for the first example, I wanted something that fits on one slide. So we, we don't have to deal with the complexity of copying and moving, at least, because we're not supporting it. Um, then we have this uh, member function called has value, which returns bool. It's just returning the valid flag so that the user has a way to check to see if there actually is a T stored in the object, because we probably don't want the user trying to access that T if there isn't one there in the first place. Uh, so that's what that member function's for. Um, then in the case that supposing that valid is true, in other words, the, the user knows that there actually is a T object stored in this uh, particular op val, object, then we might want to give them a reference to it so they can access access the value. So this is what the get member function does. It gives read-only access. It returns a constant reference to the object so they can't mutate the value when it's in the container. And again, the reason for the reinterpret cast here is just because the, the type of storage underscore is this allocated storage type in the standard library. Uh, but we really want is a reference to T. We want to return a reference to T. 
And it's safe to do this because we know because the way we've written the code, even though we've written things from the compiler's point of view that, that storage underscores a bag of bytes, we know that the only thing we ever put in that bag of bytes is a T, so it's okay to do this. But if we did, if this wasn't okay to do, like if there could be something other than a T in that bag of bytes, this would be a disaster if you do this reinterpret test because God only knows what's going to happen because you're telling the comp compiler, trust us, we really know that what's there is a T, but if it's not, then who knows what's going to happen. It's, it's, you know, you could end up with very bizarre sort of behavior. Was there a question? Or, yeah. Uh, so why can't you use a, any other cast? Like just why, why is it absolutely? Well, well, different types of casts, they allow certain types of conversions. So static casts allow certain types of things to be done. Const cast is maybe the simplest example. Const cast allows you to change the constants of something. You can either add const or remove const. Um, so there's like different restrictions, but reinterpret cast is like kind of a very relaxed thing. It let, static cast won't you let you change things in a way that kind of in a very drastic way changes the type. Like take some two types that are completely unrelated and say treat one like the other. This is what reinterpret cast does. So they have different levels of of um, like different restrictions on what types of casts are or aren't permitted. And these, there's also C style casts. Like if you're familiar with C, there's a syntax for doing casting in C. Those one kind of are free for all, like anything goes, which is one of the reasons why, like it's it's preferred that you use this particular cast operators in C++ because they're safer. When you write a particular one, there's only certain things you're allowed, and the idea is that based on what you want to do, you would only use the cast that would allow you to do that thing, and it makes it easier for people when they're looking at your code to understand the intent of what you're trying to achieve. But in this case, we need to use a reinterpret cast because we need some. We actually need to fundamentally kind of alter what the type is. Um, and reinterpret cast allows that. Does that answer your question? Yeah. There, there's a whole bunch. There's like reinterpret cast, uh, static cast, dynamic cast, other ones, const cast. I'm probably leaving some out as well. Anyway, they, but they all have different restrictions, things that they're type they're allowed to cast between and off. Uh, so where was I here? Are any other questions maybe before I proceed? Okay. Um, I guess we were talking about this talk about the clear function then. Uh, so clear is, um, and we also have some of these functions marked no except, like some of them we know categorically they wouldn't throw, like this is just returning a Boolean flag, there's no reason not to make the promise that it won't throw, there's not any kind of reasonable implementation where it could throw, so let's make that promise. So some of these are marked no except. Clear is another example here. So what clear does, or did I, actually I talked about clear before because we did these a little bit out of order, so I talked about this when we talked about the destructor. So I guess the next thing I need to talk about is set. So this is the means by which the user of the class can actually put a value into the T, that's the space for the T, the storage underscore data member. Uh, so it passes by reference, so you pass in a, a reference to a const object, a value, and what it does is first of all, if there's any, just in case there might already be a T stored in the object, it first clears anything that might be stored there. So this will set the Boolean flag to, to false, and, and if there is an object there, it will also call the destructor for it to get rid of it. And then this is the trick that now here we're using a placement view because what we want to do is we want to, we already have memory allocated, like memory that's, that's available for us to put the object in that we want to create. So we don't want to invoke operator new. So what we want to do is you only want to construct the object. So this is where we're going to use placement new. So we're using new and again, the first uh, parenthesized uh, list here is a list of placement arguments and there's only one which has type void star. So what we're doing is we're passing the address of storage. And what this is going to do, this is going to invoke a particular operate, so particular overload of operator new, which is going to construct or allocate memory. Well, it's basically going to return a pointer, sorry, not allocate memory. We'll just return this pointer back. And the end effect will be what you'll, the new expression will do is it will construct this T object using this initializer value. So this will get passed to the constructor for the class T and it will do it construct this object starting in the address starting from storage which is what we want in other words in terms of the the picture here it's going to construct the object right into this chunk of memory here and then once we've done that we want to be careful to mark valid as true so that we actually remember the fact that we put something into that, that uh, storage object so that the user can then later access it and I guess yeah, that's pretty much the whole class. So again, I tried wanted to try to keep the first example sort of simple, uh, but this gives us some some experience using like placement new, and also explicitly calling destructors as well. In this case here, we don't need to call operator new and operator delete though, because the storage that we're using for the actual T object, in other words, this thing here, it's a data member, so we don't need to allocate it. It's there by virtue of the fact the object exists in the first place. 
Any questions? Okay, so that was the first example I wanted to go through. And then we have some user code just illustrating, you know, in a little bit more concrete terms how someone might use this particular class. So here we're, uh, we're creating an optional, optional string value. So this, this object S here, it can either not store a string at all or it could store a string. And when we def we're uh, default constructing it here, so this would result in a, a, an optional value which doesn't have any string stored in it at all. And then we're checking, we're doing an assertion just to saying it doesn't have a value and this assertion should always pass. Um, then we're setting the, the string value that's stored inside this container to be hello world. And then we're asserting that yes, it does actually have a value now because this, when we put the value into the optional value, this should have set the, the Boolean flag to be true. And then this is what's being returned here. And then we're printing out the string value using the get member, which just basically returns a ref, constant reference to the string, which we print out. And then we call clear here, which is going to basically empty out the element that's stored in the container and mark it as not having the optional value anymore. And then here we're asserting that the, the container is actually claiming that there's nothing in it, which should be the case because we just cleared it. So just a very simple use case, but just, just to give you some concrete idea of how the user might use this particular optional value type. Um, op this optional value kind of idea, it's like more generally the optional um, class from the standard library. One typical usage for it might be you have a function that can return, but it can have a failure as well. It can fail as well. So maybe you want to return an int, uh, but you also have the case that the function can fail. But what happens if all the integer values are, are valid values for the success case? Then what do you do to indicate that it failed? You can't use one of the integer values. So you could, for example, return an optional value where it's an optional int. So if things succeed, it returns the integer value and there is actually something in the optional object, which is, is the value that you're returning. But in the case something fails, what you do, do is you return an optional value that has no value, like it's empty. And then that could be as a signal that things went wrong. Um, so this sort of idea is, is quite useful, for example, sometimes for return values, propagating return values back, where, where you can have functions that fail. Anyway, so all, all I'm trying to point out is there is some kind of practical applications for the, the type of class we just talked about. There is a reason why the standard library has something like that. Um, before I can go through the other two code examples that I want to talk about, I first need to introduce a few uh, functions from the standard library that are quite useful for the, the purposes of these examples so that we don't have to write, end up writing them ourselves. Uh, so sometimes we have, when we're doing the sort of stuff that we're doing in the, in the code that we're discussing now, we sometimes need to do things where we're working with uninitialized storage. Like, so we have so, some bag of bytes but there's nothing constructed in it, like it's just raw memory. And then we want to do things like construct objects in that memory or, or maybe some of that memory later on, we want to destroy the objects that we put there. Um, so there's a number of convenience functions that are provided in the standard library that are helpful for this purpose. So they allow us to like move things in, copy things into raw memory and also destroy things and so on. So these are um, outlined on the next couple of slides. So for some of these, I'll just go, go through some pictures to sort of explain what they do. And, and the other ones kind of follow a similar pattern. So you can sort of fill in the blanks that I don't cover by sort of extending the extrapolating on the ideas that I do present. Uh, so for example, the, the first one I'm going to talk about is the uh, uninitialized copy and uninitialized, well, yeah, uninitialized copy and uninitialized move. Uh, so what these do is maybe better explain in terms of a picture. So this is this picture here, and I think I might need to zoom out a bit. So this is the uninitialized copy and uninitialized move function. So basically they take uh, like three iterators. Um, the first two iterators specify a range. So what you have is like a raw, like a raw chunk of memory, uninitialized memory here. And you have some range that's indicated by this, this uh, these iterators first and last, where last is like one past the end. So basically elements from first to last, not including last. And what you want to do is that range of elements, the ones here, you want to either copy them or move them into this raw memory. So you're going to invoke a copy or move constructor to construct into this raw memory the elements that are up here. So like this one here, we get copied or moved into this slot. This one here, we get copied or moved into this slot and so on. And the return value, both of these functions have a return value, which is an iterator. And the iterator that's returned is it returns an iterator to one past the end here. In other words, as you're writing the result into this iterator here, the third parameter is where you want to write the result to. Um, it it's stepping along through this array, and at the end, basically, it's sitting here, and that's the value that's returned. So this is the uninitialized move and uninitialized copy. And then the next one here, there's some that have like n in the name. So the only difference is how you're specifying the range, because you can specify a range in terms of like a, two iterators, a begin and end sort of thing, or you can specify a begin and a count. 
So the, the ones that have N in the name are essentially just specifying the range in terms of, a, you give it the beginning, an iterator that refers to the beginning, and then a count. So for uninitialized copy N, uninitialized move N, it's the same sort of picture. You have a range that you want to either copy or move, construct into some raw memory here that's not initialized. And the only difference is here we provide a first, like there's the, the parameters are first, which is an iterator, and then a count is the second parameter, which is n. So instead of giving last, you just specify n, and then basically last would be first plus n. Sometimes this is more convenient for some usages that you might have. And then the last one I want to talk about is fill, at least on this slide anyway. Um, so what fill does, fill does here so it takes a, like two iterators to specify a range and then a value. And what it's going to do is it's going to take this value and it's going to propagate it into, this is uninitialized memory here. It's going to basically copy um, all of, copy this element into each one of these elements here. So it just basically fills memory with a particular value. So if that's an object, is it it's create one of them and copy it? Or does it actually um, make a separate constraint? You talk about the fill here, so this one. Yeah, we'll these them separately. Yeah, so you're going to basically invoke, for example, like a copy constructor, get repeat invoke for each object each time, because you have this thing and you basically want to propagate its value to here and to here and to here and to here. So it's going to take oh, okay. this and it's, it's going to keep copy, construct, copy, construct, copy, 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 to propagate the value. Any, any other questions? And then one more slide, there's a bunch of other ones. Like, for example, you can default construct a bunch of elements in a range. So I, basically the picture, maybe you can kind of guess what it looks like. So the one that involves default construction. So you give it iterators that specify a range and these iterators re refer to like a range in, of raw memory. So memory that's not been initialized. And what it will do is it'll just walk through each element in the range and default construct an object into that slot. And the other, one I want to talk about here is uh, destroy, because we need to be able to destroy objects. So this one here, it, again, it takes a range, so first and last, and what it will do is it will walk through this. So this it's assuming that this memory actually has been initialized, and it's going to walk through and destroy each element in this range, starting from the first one, like call the destructor for this object, call the destructor for this object, and then this object, and so on, until it hits the end. And then there's a few other ones here, like some of them have ends, some of them don't have ends, but the, basically the kind of the pattern follows. The ones that have ends in them, you're specifying like a start and then an end, or you don't specify the end, instead you give a count of how many elements. And I think that's all I want to say about these. Um, some examples of implementations, like the reason why you might want to have these provided by the library, some of these are, well, some of them are kind of trivial, but some of them are more gross and you have to be kind of careful to get them right because of exceptions. So. Um, some of them are kind of more trivial, like there's one called destroy at, which takes a pointer, which is basically saying, like, I want to destroy the object that lives at this point in memory. All it's doing is just directly invoking the destructor. So this is a kind of very trivial example. There's maybe not that much benefit to having a function like that in the library. Um, this one is maybe a little bit more helpful. You maybe save a few lines of code. This basically destroys was the, the possible implementation for the destroy function that we just looked at before, where it basically provide a pair of iterators. And it keeps looping from first to last, and it's basically destroying everything in that range. And for example, you have to use address of here because you don't know if the, what the type, like the, this is template code. So if you use the, ad, the actual address of operator, maybe for some types, it won't do what you expect. So we have to be careful to use address of in contexts like this. Uh, but the reason why these library functions are quite helpful is like some of these functions are kind of more gross. And it's because of the fact that, that things can fail due to exceptions being thrown. So in this case, this is the uninitialized copy. This is the one where you specify a pair of iterators first and last, which you're going to copy from. It's sort of the source for the copy operation. And then you have some raw memory that's uninitialized, which is starting at result. And you want to basically copy elements from the, the first range into the second range. But things can kind of go wrong because um, I suppose that you start doing, so as you might suspect, what we're going to do is a whole bunch of placement use. So we're going to keep, we're going to loop basically incrementing this uh, pointer current, which is going to walk through the, the, the place where we're going to be storing the, the results that we're copying. It's basically the destination that we're going to copy into. And we're basically just doing a new expression where we're specifying through a placement parameter um, that we want to write the, well, the address of star current. So like this is the current place where we're writing the result to. So we're going to just 
construct the object into that place in memory. And then we're just letting this current pointer walk, walk along. Um, we keep incrementing it each time. But the, the reason why this is a little bit more gross, this code, is that what happens, everything is fine if, you, if it fails and it fails right away. So before you call, like the very first constructor you call here throws an exception, that's okay. But the thing is, you probably won't be so lucky. What will happen, it will construct a few and then it fails. If that happens, then you have to clean up and destroy the things that were constructed. So this is why there's this grossness where this is inside of a try block. And then if an exception is, any exception is thrown, we catch any exception with dot, dot, dot. And then what we do, what this loop is doing is any of the objects that were constructed, it then destroys them. Because uh, otherwise those objects will get leaked because the compiler doesn't know to, to clean them up in this particular context. So this is invoke, directly invoking the destructor. And then we just rethrow the exception to propagate it. Anyway, so this is the reason why a lot of these functions are helpful to use in the library because, I mean, you could write them, but you have to be kind of very careful the first time you do it to make sure that you, you know, any exceptions that might be thrown, you catch them and then, un like, clean up any stuff that's been partly done. Any questions about that? Okay. So the next example I want to go through is a, a bounded array example. Um, this is similar to, there's something in the boost library called static vector, so it's somewhat similar to this, kind of a like, very stripped down bare bones version of, of this particular class. And, and basically what it is, it's also similar to std array in the standard library, except that if the size of the array can change, uh, the number, or maybe I should say more precisely, like the number of elements in the array can change. The allocated size doesn't change. So what we have is a picture which looks something like this, where we have a chunk of storage which is sufficient to store an array where the elements in the array have type T and there's N elements. So this array here has N slots, capital N slots in it. So it can hold up to N elements and these slots are big enough to hold objects of type T. Um, and there, that array is always there. It's actually inside the array object itself. Um, it's not out somewhere else in memory and then we have a pointer from our, our array object pointing to it. It's actually stored inside the, the object itself. And then what we have is a pointer which points to one past the last valid entry in the, the array. We don't need a pointer to the beginning because the beginning is always going to be here. We don't need a pointer to the end because we know the size of this array, so it's kind of implicit what the end is. But we do need to know how many elements are actually in there because it, we allow it to be empty potentially or it could have any number of elements from zero up to n. So we somehow need to track which one is the last one. So this is what this pointer does. So in this picture here, the elements that are shown in white are the elements that are actually, like there's actually valid data there. The stuff that's shaded are basically just garbage values. They're uninitialized, it's like raw memory that hasn't been set to anything yet. So this is the basic picture that we have. And if I go to, um, just as a, I have a helper class that we're going to use in the, the actual code example that goes with this diagram here. Um, because this is the only purpose of this helper class is just to avoid having to write out many, many reinterpret casts all over the place. Because uh, in the previous example, there was only maybe two places or something where we needed a reinterpret cast. But in this code example, without this helper class, there'll be like a lot of reinterpret casts all over the place. So just to kind of factor them out and put them into one place, I have something that's kind of a little bit like the line storage, the class from the standard library, except this particular class, template class, it knows its type, like it knows something about the type. And then I can provide some member functions that provide, basically they do the reinterpret cast for me. So what this is, it, um, this thing I'm calling a line buffer, it's, it can store n elements of type T. So it's like a buffer which is suitably aligned to hold elements of type T and it can hold up to n of them. Um, this is a little bit different from the aligned storage class because the aligned storage class, it, it's dumb. Like it doesn't know what type it is. It's just a bag of bytes that has a certain alignment. Um, but this the fact that this knows about the type allows me to provide helpful member functions. So if I want to point you to the start of the array, I, and probably I don't want it as just a pointer to like a char or something. I probably want it as a pointer to a T. Um, so I can do this because this class actually knows the type of the elements that I'm putting in this array. So I can have a member function start, which is overloaded as a const version and non-const version. And similarly for end, I can have a pointer, which is basically kind of one past the end in the array. So I just use these as a, as a convenience. Uh, otherwise, you could do this, you could do the code example that I'm about to show you without this class, but the consequence is just going to be a lot of reinterpret casts all over the place. And again, I'm trying to minimize the number of slides that this example spreads across. It's already kind of getting longer. It doesn't fit on one slide. And if I have a lot more reinterpret casts, it's going to take even a lot longer. So anyway, that's the basic idea behind this class here. So if we look at the actual array class, which is the one that we want to focus on here, um, 
we have uh, two data members, which is what I was showing in the picture before. We have this aligned buffer. So what this is, is just a bag of bytes that can hold elements of type T and it can hold N of them. So basically the size of the array is like N times size of T and it has alignment that's suitable for type T. Uh, but in addition, it has these member functions start and end, which are very helpful. And I use them in quite a few different places in the code here. Uh, so if we look at the, the interface that's provided by this, this array type, um, we have a default constructor. And the idea here is this should just create an array which is empty. I mean, we always have the storage for n elements because it's baked into the actual object itself. But we don't require that the user always has to have n elements that are stored there. It can be flexible anyway from 0 to n. So the idea is with the default constructor, we want to construct an object, an array object, that would correspond to the array being empty. So the way we achieve this is we just make the finish pointer, which points one past the, the last valid entry, to be equal to start, the start of the buffer, and which would basically be equivalent to saying that there's, there's nothing in the buffer, or nothing in the array, I should say. Um, then we have, well, I'll look at the code for these functions later, because the, the, the copy constructor and the move constructor, these are more complicated. They can't really fit in, in, in here in just a one-liner. So we'll look at them later. Uh, the destructor, what it does is it invokes a member function clear, which we'll look at later. But all clear does is it, it just gets rid of any elements that are in the container. So if it's not empty, it will call the destructor to destroy the elements that are there. And, and essentially, that's what clear does. And then we also have uh, copy and move assignment operators as well. And these are a little bit more involved, so they appear on subsequent slides. Um, we have another constructor for the array where we can specify um, a size, so it'll create an array which has a certain number of elements already in it. And size has to be less than or equal to n. You can't create it with more elements than it's capable of holding. And we have another a constructor that takes a size and a value. So that what the idea is, this will create a container that has uh, size elements in it, and each one of them is initialized to value. And then we have another member function here. This one's kind of a trivial one. It just appears on the same line. Max size, it just returns the maximum size, the maximum number of elements that the container can hold, which is simply the template parameter n. And then size returns how many elements are actually stored in the container, which is just going to be the difference between finish and, and start, the start of the buffer. Because if you take the difference between two pointers, it gives you the number of elements between them, which would be the number of elements that's stored in the container. Um, then we have a subscripting operator Obviously, it takes an index, in this case, an integer index, and it just returns an index, it indexes from the start of the array. And the idea being the user is not going to give us something that's out of range. It doesn't do any range checking here, but the presumption is the user is not going to do something silly like give things out of range. And this is overloaded. We have a const version of this member function and a, a non-const version, but the code is essentially the same. The only difference is one of them returns a reference to something that's not const, one that returns a reference to something that is const just to make the code const correct. Uh, we have another member function that returns a reference to the last element in the container. So because finish points one past the end, to get to the one that's actually at the end, the valid data at the end, we would have to back up by one. So we're indexing by minus one from finish, which is basically the same. It's just kind of subtracting one from the pointer and then dereferencing it. But this is a little bit more compact to write in this way. And this is overloaded um, on const. So we have a non-const version of this member function. The const version, the code's identical, the only difference is the return type. Uh, because we're not allowed to modify the object, in this case, we have to return a const reference. Otherwise, the user could use the reference to modify the object, which would be a bad thing. Um, then we have a pushback, which works you know, just like std vector pushback, basically adds something onto the end of the container. A popback, which basically pops an element from the, the, end, of the end of the list of elements inside the array. And then clear, which I think I mentioned before, it just basically clears out the array. So we've covered some of the more kind of trivial functions, the ones that fit on one line, but the more interesting ones are the ones that follow on the subsequent slides. Uh, so we're gonna kind of walk through each one of these. And in these, in these functions, we're gonna be using some of those uninitialized memory functions that I was talking about a moment ago, like uninitialized copy, things like that. Um, yeah. So if we, if we look at, uh, we'll just go through things in the order that they appear here, otherwise maybe I'll, I'll miss some things. So the first thing that we have is a, uh, a constructor for the array class. And this is going to be, I guess, a copy constructor because of the reference parameter that's being passed here. So if you want to copy construct an array, what do we need to do? Well, we're going to need to, need to copy from the other array into the, the, the storage area that we have for the current array, the one that this object's being, or this uh, constructor is being invoked for. So we're going to call uninitialized copy. And what we're going to do is we're going to copy from 
from the start, like the array it, the, the, in the other object that we want to copy from, we're going to copy from its start up until the, the end of the array, like the, the, the actual elements that are in use, and we're going to copy them to the destination, which is the start of our buffer, like the one that this object's being invoked for. And the return value of an initialized copy, it, it returns the, where the pointer ends up, the destination pointer after everything's copied, so it would be like one past the end of the, where you're copying to, which is the value that we'd want finish to have. In other words, the return value is going to be the one past the last element in the current array that we're initializing or we're constructing. Um, and in some cases, we need, we need static casts. Um, these static casts are, are because of the fact that um, this function is a template function, and uh, some of these parameters here are pointers to const, other ones aren't, and, and because of the way that templates work, they, they, they only will get used if things sort of match up to like non-trivial like non differences, but const isn't a non-trivial difference, so because of this, we need this const, uh, data const here. Um, this is just adding const, though. It's not removing cons. You can always add cons. Removing cons, you have to be more careful about. Right, these these two iterators here are both const iter like pointers which point to const. So we need to make the constness of these match, I believe, because of the way the uninitialized copy is defined. Anyways, don't worry but too much about that if you didn't understand what I meant. But but you might notice this sometimes when you're when you're using template functions. Templates only get used when there's a very close match, only, only non-trivial differences in types. So sometimes you might need to cast some of the parameters or explicitly specify the template parameters here in angle brackets. So this is basically what this is trying to uh, get around. If we go on to the uh, move constructor here, so this is a move constructor because we have an R value reference parameter here. Uh, so here we're using uninitialized move. It's a similar sort of structure to what we have above, but it, rather than doing copy, we want to do a move. But otherwise things are essentially very similar. Um, then if we go on to the, uh, I guess this is a copy assignment operator. In this case, the very first thing we do is we check to make sure we're not doing self-assignment. Um, in this case, I think it will probably be, a, probably be a disaster if we don't check for this and we just blindly go ahead and, and do what we would normally do in the non-self-assignment case, because uh, we're probably going to trample over or, or do some weird things anyway, because we're going to be reading and writing to the same place in memory. Anyway, so we're careful to make sure that we're not doing self-initialization. If we are doing self-initialization, the if just gets skipped over and we just return a reference to this because we don't need to do anything. Like this would be like saying like array x equals x. Um, but if we are not doing self-assignment, then we actually need to do some work. So essentially what we're doing here is we're first uh, clearing out the object that we're operating on. This is going to be the destination for the copy operation. So we're going to clear it out first. Any, any elements that are stored there get get removed from the container, and then what we're going to do effectively is like a copy. We're going to copy from the other container into the, the current container. And then again, we return a reference to uh, star this. And then if you go on to the move assignment, um, this is kind of questionable whether you want to check for self-assignment because I would argue probably in any reasonable code, self-assignment is not self-assignment for the move case is not going to happen. Um, but I would probably recommend either putting an assertion in or, or actually handling the case if you don't put an assertion in just to be extra safe. Uh, but probably it might be better to put an assertion. Anyway, so we're checking for self-assignment here, but in the move case, it's probably not really required. Um, and what we do is we first of all clear out the, the uh, object that we're operating on, which is the destination for the move assignment. And then we basically move all the elements from the, the source of the move, which is this other object into the current object. Again, using uninitialized move, just like what we were doing up here. The main difference being, like in the case that we're constructing, because we're constructing the object, there, we don't have to clear out anything in the current object because it's not, been, it's not initialized yet. Whereas in this case, there's a little bit of a difference. You have to call clear because it might be the case, since we're already existing, an already existing variable, the object that's being copied to, we may have to clear out, object, or clear out elements from the array that are already there. Any questions about any of the functions on this slide? Okay, we'll go on to the next one then. Um, what do we have here? So here we have another constructor. This constructor is the one that takes a size. So the idea is this is going to create an array, um, of, like an, an array which has size elements in it and they're all default constructed. Um, so what we're doing here is we're checking to make sure the size just is kind of basic sanity check. I guess the interface of this is such that 
it, it's not a strict precondition that size has to be less than equal to n. So because of this is actually checking as an if, and if you try to specify a size bigger than what can be handled, it just says, I don't, I'm going to, you know, cap it at size. It sets it to size. Um, Anyway, did it, because I tried to make the example fit on a slide, the, the full API specification is not really given in terms of preconditions and so on, but you can kind of infer from the way the code is written that it is valid for the user to specify a size bigger than the size of the array, but the, what the library does is it, or what this class does is it will just cap it at max size. So if you ask for something bigger than what can be handled, it will just take the maximum size it actually can handle. And then all we're doing here is we're just going to invoke the default constructor n times and essentially the range that we're going to default construct into is the start of our buffer, and we're going to do this for n elements. So construct n, it starts here, and then it goes on for n elements, constructing another object, another object, and so on, invoking the default constructor. And when all of this is done, we need to set our finish pointer, the one that's one past the last valid element in the array, to be the start plus size, because this would be one past the last element that we just added. Uh, if we go on to the next constructor, this one here, it takes a size, and a value, so the idea is this is going to take this value that's specified and create a container that has size elements in it that are all equal to value. So it's gonna take this value here and propagate it into size elements in the container. Uh, so again, the first thing we do is just check to make sure size is not larger than the, the actual size of the array so we don't overwrite, overwrite data that comes after the end of the array. And then we call uninitialized fill n. And again, what fill does is it takes this value here and it propagates it into this range here that's specified by start and size. So like from start to start plus size. And the return value is, is essentially the last one pass, the last thing that we wrote, which is going to be one pass the last valid element in the array. So this is what the return value from this function is what we use to initialize finish, our finish uh, data member. And then if we look at pushback, what pushback is doing is taking an element of type T and we want to basically stick it onto the end of the array. Um, so the first thing that we're doing is we're just checking to make sure that the array is not full. If the array is full, one consequence of that would be that the finish is going to be pointing um, basically one past the end of the array. So that's that uh, the storage area that we have in our, that's called buff underscore in this example. Um, so buff end is basically a pointer to one past the end of the array. So if finish is sitting there, it means that we've basically completely used the array and there's no space left. So this thing just returns. It doesn't throw any exception or anything, like if you try to, the interface is specified in such a way that if you try to push back and the, the, there's no more space in the, the array, it just returns silently and doesn't do anything. It leaves the array untouched. And uh, otherwise, we continue on here and we're going to do a fill. We're gonna fill in, so do an uninitialized fill. So what this will do is it will copy, or copy the value, value, starting at finish and going for n times. In this case, n is one. So we'll basically just copy the value once to finish, which is what we want. We only want to put it into the container once. We don't want to repeat it multiple times. So for pop back, we want to uh, decrement the finish pointer because finish is pointing one past the last valid element. So if we back it up by one, this will be essentially removing the last element from the container. But then we have to be careful to actually destroy that object that the, the finish pointer is pointing at. Because uh, when we back up the finish pointer, it's now pointing at a valid element, but we don't want that element to be valid because finish is supposed to be pointing one past the last valid, valid element. So we call destroy at. And all destroy at does, it just takes this pointer here and it directly invokes the destructor using that pointer. So it destroys the object that that pointer is pointing to. Oh, and just one, one more, uh, just to squeeze this in here so we can finish this example. So what clear does is it just clears out the contents of the container, removes all elements from the container. So it calls destroy over the range from start to finish. So it's gonna walk through all the elements that are in the container, destroying them, and it sets the finish pointer to the beginning of the array, meaning that there's no elements in the container. So that takes us to the end of this example. Any questions? <laughs>